Shalom, shalom. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. I'm delighted to hear that you are drawn to the Jewish root that supports the grafted in branches. You know, Torah is central to properly understand and perform the will of Hashem, that is, God. It is crucial for us to understand theologically that the primary purpose in Hashem's giving of the Torah as a way of making someone forensically righteous only achieves its goal when the person, by faith, accepts that Yeshua, Jesus, is the promised Messiah spoken about therein. Welcome to Parashat Chukat Regulations. The address is Bamidbar, Numbers, chapter 19, verse 1 through chapter 22, verse 1. The reading day is for Shabbat, and I'm the author to our teacher, Ariel Ben Lyman. The written notes were updated on June 19th of 2007. Note that all quotations are taken from the complete Jewish Bible translation by David H. Stern, Jewish New Testament Publications Incorporated, unless otherwise noted. Let's begin with the opening blessing for the Torah. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim v'natan lanu et Torato. Baruch ata Adonai noten ha-Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have selected us from among all the peoples and have given us your Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Well, our parasha this week is Chukat, and uh, I put a little um, transliteration there, C-H-O-O-K-A-H-T. It sounds like the two, the two words, who, W-H-O, and coupled with the word caught, C-A-U-G-H-T. kind of sounds like that, Chukat, um, if you can't actually get the guttural out of your throat there, Chukat. Now, actually, this Hebrew word shares the same root word as a previous uh, as a previous Torah portion. Um, we had a portion in Leviticus; it's the very last portion, called uh, Parashat Bahukotai. Okay, Bahukotai. Now, the ch in uh, in in Bahukotai uh, is as the ch in Bach. It's it's a guttural sound, Bach, Bahukotai, and it also comes from our root word. So. Um, this parasha, uh, Chukat, and the parasha Bechukotai, they have the same root word, which of which in Hebrew is Chok. Okay, if you write it out in transliteration, Chok, it it's usually translated along the lines of C H O K E. It looks like choke, but it's actually the two um, letters, um, Chet and Kaf. So uh, um, I'm sorry, Kof, not Kaf. Chet and Kof. So it means statute, limit, ordinance, something prescribed, and that's according to Brown Driver and Briggs Jesenius Lexicon. Look at my footnote to number one. Again, I'm, um, I'm uh, uh, big on finding out what words mean and how they're used because uh, what ends up happening in Judaism, just like any other language, is, or in Hebrew, just like any other language, is you find words that have synonyms and um, in the synonymous uses of the word, we can help to understand the word group or the um, word association that uh, the particular term is trying to convey. In this case, uh, this word chok, it should not be confused with its synonym Torah, uh, which is also sometimes translated along the same lines of, of statute, limit, ordinance, or something prescribed. I like to think that there's a nuance difference, and the main difference is the nuance that each word is attempting to convey. Uh, for instance, chok is an ordinance, whereas Torah is teaching. It seems to be that that's the nuance between the two words. But again, they are used in synonymous circles. They're used in 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 uh, same circles. They are um, they're used in in in, in tandem sometimes, uh, one with the other. 
Now, because our portion deals with the central Torah injunction, that is to say the ashes of the red heifer, the, uh, the para aduma, then I want to briefly repeat some of the important concepts concerning Torah as law. And I want to do that for people maybe who are new to my parashot, new to my commentaries, new to my podcasts, who maybe just joined and aren't really kind of following along with how I am conveying this, this, this relationship to the Torah of Hashem. Some of the material that I'm going to be speaking on uh, up front here will actually come from Parashat Bohukotai, okay? So if you want to read the entire um, notes that I'm lifting from at the moment, just go to the last portion in, in Leviticus, Vaikra, and uh, navigate all the way to Parashat Bohukotai, and you can get the full gist of this. But let me just pull a brief quote, all right? This next section is entitled, Let's Recall. In Judaism, safeguarding and keeping the Torah is actually central to performing the will of Hashem. And you can reference Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1 for this information. It's important that I say this right up front because of the tradition that we in the church, when I say the church, I mean the um, garden variety definition of the term church, um, whereas the, it's, a, it's a body of, of, of people, an organization, that has decidedly defined herself over and against an existing group known as Judaism. Thus, Christianity and Judaism stand uh, uh, opposite one another, as it were. And in this definition, these, these, these self-created definitions, um, the church gains a, a separate identity out and away from uh, the synagogue, i.e. Uh, the existing Judaisms. This is the definition that is most often uh, applied in normative uh, conversation circles today. It's what I might call the conventional definition of the word church. In truth, and this is a side note, but it's worth uh, bearing out. In truth, I do not espouse to a separate people group known as the church, separate and distinct from the people group known as Israel. In fact, as I read the Bible, the unified word of God from Genesis to maps, as uh, my good friend Norm Franz would say, then the church in the Bible is in actuality the body of Messiah, i.e. remnant Israel. Therefore, the church should not be defined over and against Israel or over and against um, their Jewish counterparts. The church is actually the 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 ecclesia is the Greek term, and it refers to those who have been called out from the nations by God himself, called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. That definition, called out, is identical to Israel's call. Specifically, it is identical to the remnant of Israel who has truly joined herself to Israel's God. Within the heart, there is a real uh, relationship with God, and this means that they are in love with Messiah, and they are in love with Israel's God, and consequently, they are in love with Israel's laws. So, let's go back to my commentary. Judaism has, has preserved, and thank goodness they have, Judaism has preserved down through the centuries of her history, 34, 3500 years of, of Jewish history, if I could use the term Jewish in an anachronistic sense, that safeguarding and keeping the Torah is central to doing the will of God. And that is absolutely true. So the church needs to understand this. Indeed, as properly understood from Hashem's point of view, the whole of the Torah, God's laws, God's instructions, they were given to bring its followers, whether Jew or Gentile, to the goal of acquiring the kind of faith in Hashem that leads to placing one's faith, one's trusting faithfulness, that is, in the one and only Son of Hashem, Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay? You can reference Luke chapter 24, verse 27, as well as Luke 44 through 47, uh, chapter 24 uh, as well. And then also jump over to Romans 10, 4 and you'll see that the goal at which the Torah aims is the Messiah. Okay? God gave the Torah for many varied reasons, but one of the central reasons for God giving the Torah is to provide a remedy for the broken relationship that mankind 
found himself in after the incident in the garden. The Torah becomes his blueprint for holy living, but it becomes his map to find him his way back to God. The Torah is given to point the individual towards the Messiah. This is what Shaul meant in uh, the book of Galatians when he talks about how the Torah is a, um, it's a schoolmaster to lead us to the teacher of righteousness. Now to this end, the Torah has prophesied about Yeshua from as early as the book of Genesis with the first messianic prophecy in Genesis 3.15. And the Torah, the Bible, continues to speak of him until its conclusion in Revelation 22, verse 20. So in this capacity, the Torah itself acts like its etymological counterpart, yara. The word Torah, the noun Torah, is actually um, rooted in the word yara, which itself is an archery term, according to Brown, Driver, and Briggs lexicon again, the BDB. Um, yara is an archery term, it's a verb, and um, it, it implies leading or, or um, what's the word I want, tutelage, or, or instruction, or, or uh, focusing. Um, if you think of the, in the, uh, the motif of the archer, um, the archer has this, this goal. Uh, this we call it a uh, um, you know the, the bullseye and the target down range, and the archer stands poised with his bow and his arrow and he and he places the arrow in the bow string you know and he pulls the back he pulls the string back and he steadies himself and he aims and he carefully lines the bow up and lines the arrow up so that it will travel down the path that he is directing it towards, which is the goal, the, the, the target down at the other end, namely the bullseye. And he, at the, when, the, when the time is right, he will release the arrow down towards the, uh, the goal of hitting the bullseye. That whole notion, the, the, the concept behind the actions involved, uh, the steadying himself, the readying the bow, the readying the arrow, the, the, the carefully uh, uh, pointing the arrow in the right direction and then releasing it at the right moment. All of that, that whole concept, that whole word picture that I just described, is yara in Hebrew. And yara is where we get the word Torah. So if you can kind of make the connection, God is the archer, and God um, sees us, I would I imagine, as the, the, the arrow. And the, um, the, the bullseye, or the target, down at the other end, is the Messiah. And so what God does is he utilizes the tool known as Torah, along with the Holy Spirit, obviously, to carefully send the student, the, the arrow, down the path of life towards the Messiah. So the goal of Yara, the goal of, of Torah, is to introduce the individual, namely man, to the Messiah. Okay, So Torah teaches, because that's a better translation of the word Torah, sometimes we translate it as law, but law, if you recall, can sometimes conjure up the idea of chok, ordinance, and it sounds very stiff, very rigid, very cold. But Torah has within it, in case you didn't catch it when I was describing the archer, Torah carries within it the idea of loving instruction. There's, there's, there's a human quality there, or in the, in the case of the archer, it's a human, but in the case of God, it's divine. Um, there's care, there's instruction, there's, there's, there's great, uh, 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 as it were, um, well, care and, and, and uh, precision involved. There's intellect involved, there's choice. Uh, all of these things are involved in the teaching, the instruction that God lovingly places within our lives, within our situations, so that we can find the Messiah when our heart is tender and when the moment is right, the moment uh, set forth by the Father. So Torah teaches its adherents how to properly identify with Hashem by helping them to reach the mark. That's what the Torah does in our lives, both before we find Yeshua as well as after we encounter the teacher of righteousness. Once we reach the goal, the Torah does not use, I'm sorry, the Torah does not lose its functionality within our lives, okay? It, uh, it, it then becomes our blueprint for proper living, maintaining a right relationship with God, not on the basis of human effort, 
but based on the cooperation of the Spirit working within our lives to bring about an effectual sanctifying within our lives, okay? So, one of the most common Hebrew verbs used to identify sin, which is chata, literally means to miss the mark. Imagine the archer again. He's holding the bow steady. He's, he's holding his arrow. He's already pulled it back. He's, he's closed one eye. He's held, holding his breath. He's about to release. And then he gets distracted. Something, he's, something catches his eye out of the corner of his eye. He looks over or he sneezes. And in that sneeze or that distraction, he releases the arrow. And the arrow completely misses the, 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 the target altogether. That term does used to describe to miss the mark is chata. I'm sorry, chata, uh, or chata. The verb chata means to miss the mark. So uh, now we can see the relation between sin and Torah. Thus, now we can understand why John in the book of First John says that the definition of sin is the transgression of Torah. See how it works? Okay. This next section, I want to focus in on the uh, Torah portion for today, the para aduma, the red heifer. So this next section is entitled Para Aduma, a unique commandment. Now, the mitzvah of the red heifer, commonly referred to in Judaism as Para Aduma, which literally means red cow. Para, cow, Aduma, red. Aduma is related to the Hebrew word for uh, for for Adam, a man. Adam or Adama means um, uh, earth. Uh, you know, the ground is 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 red. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, para aduma, red cow. Now, it's a peculiar command indeed. A couple of details make this mitzvah very, very unique, okay? And I'm going to go through some of them so you can understand the, the seeming paradox associated with this particular commandment. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make an, a messianic application so that we can gain further insight as to why perhaps Hashem has instituted this particular mitzvah. Well, to begin with, the participants... Um, of this particular mitzvah, if you read through the story, are commanded to slaughter and burn completely this female cow without blemish. Now, if you recall from reading Vaikra from Leviticus, touching a dead animal's carcass renders one tame, which is ritually unclean. You shall not touch, touch a carcass. If you touch a carcass, you are tuma. You are unclean. You are a tuma. And in your state of uncleanliness, you are prohibited from certain tabernacle uh, functions and, and, and duties. So as we discover from our current portion here at chapter 19, specifically verses 7 through 22, the preparation of the ashes also rendered the individuals involved tame. So they took the cow, they slaughtered it, they burned it completely according to the command. And in the preparation of the mixture that we're going to talk about, the ashes, in the prep work, it rendered them unclean. That's the first thing that's unique about this, or the first thing that is odd about this, okay? What makes it odd is that the end result of their efforts produced a substance that possessed the supernatural ability to, watch this, cleanse as Hashem endowed it. Isn't that interesting? They prepare a substance that renders them unclean in the preparation, but the end result is a substance that will cleanse. It's true, the real healing always comes from Hashem. Don't get me wrong. But in this case, the focal point of the healing, the ash mixture that's, that's the result, began by defiling those who made the mixture. Peculiar indeed. So herein lies the secret of faith. To follow Hashem's instructions to the letter was to act and live in an arena of trusting faithfulness. Do you see how that works? God's ways are above our ways. We cannot understand why God asks us to do things that just don't make sense to us. To do what the Torah asked sometimes required its participants, not all the time, but sometimes, it required its followers to perform various rituals and functions that defy logic and common sense. We talked about this last week in Parashat Korach, how that Korach, the, the, you know, the rebel, the one who challenged Moshe, he and the 250 uh, leaders from Israel that challenged Moshe's leadership, in the um, sayings from, preserved for us from Lewis Ginsburg's work, The Legends of the Jews, we have Korach 
challenging Moshe with these ridiculous details concerning commandments that are supposedly, from Korach's point of view, from God. For instance, God says to Moshe, tell the people of Israel to take their garments and insert a thread of blue, a tachelet, into the tzitzit, and in rendering this blue into the one single thread, you, in essence, become obedient to the commandment, and it also, the, it, the blue thread itself, reminds you of your obligation to keep the commandments. So Korach comes along, looks at this one blue thread added to an entire garment, and thinks to himself, okay, if one blue thread renders me holy, as it were, or sanctified, set apart, a commandment keeper, then perhaps if I dyed my entire garment blue, maybe I'm even more holy. And so he challenges Moshe with this, the logic behind dyeing one single thread blue, weaving it into the other threads, wearing it on the end of your garments, and supposedly making you holy. Sounds ridiculous, no? So th it's things like this. Another one that he talked about, which was kind of interesting, in case you didn't catch last week's, last week's portion, was that in Judaism and within the Torah, God asks Israel to take some words from the Torah and write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. This is, of course, taken from the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And in this instruction, Israel has constructed... Uh, this little box uh, that we now refer to as a mezuzah, in which in, it's a little container, and within this con within this container, this little box, um, there are uh, three passages taken from the Torah, and we what we end up doing in order to step into the mitzvah of of um, um, writing it on the doorpost of our houses and our gates, instead of actually writing it on the doorpost, which would, might be the door jam, and the gates themselves, uh, Jewish people today, in fact or Torah observant people today, in fact, write the, um, the those three passages, put them in the little box, and they attach this box, as it were, to the uh, to the door jam. And this way, if they are ever evicted or if they ever move, they can just simply take the uh, the little parchment and the little, the little box with them. So this is a mezuzah, right? So Korach comes along and says, okay, here we go. I'm going to talk about the logic of this. If one little box containing um, a little bit of scripture renders the house holy, as it were, sanctified, set apart for God, then why should we have to attach one of these little boxes to, say, a Bet Knesset or a Bet Migdash, um, where we have a, a house of study, like a synagogue or a church, where in which we have the entire scroll of the Torah, why do we also have to attach a mezuzah to such a, 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 an edifice, a house, Shouldn't the scrolls inside render the place holy enough? Why do we have to um, add to the ostensible holiness by attaching a little box with a bunch of scriptures in it? Such such um, utter foolishness re behind some of these mitzvot. It, it defies logic. It, I mean, a, a, in fact, let me just ask you, those of you listening to my podcast right now, how how holy does it make you feel to put tzitzit on your garments? Give me a break, right? Give me a break. The world looks at us those of us who wear tzitzit, and they say, what is this? These little, th this beadwork dangling off your shirt. What is that, supposed to make you holy or something? You're supposed to be holier than me now? Because you're wearing these little strings and I'm not? You're, you're better in God's eyes than I am? You see the potential for the defying of logic within some of the commandments of God? How can one day of the week possibly be infused with holiness over and against all the other six days of the week? What's the big deal? One day versus six. This is the, the, the challenge facing anyone who decides to walk into the commandments of God because some of them defy logic. Or they defy reason. They just don't make any sense. Why would God ask us to do things? And to be honest with you, you can go throughout the entire Tanakh and find times where, where the prophets or the, or the leaders or the, or the, 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 the apostle or, or Yeshua himself was found to be doing things that just don't make sense to our natural mind. You know, a blind man comes up to Yeshua and says, Heal me. Yeshua says, Fine. Yeshua stoops down and he spits into the dirt. I can see the blind man, you know, because he's listening. He can't see what's going on, but he's listening. He hears Yeshua, you know, and he, and he spits into the ground and, and the blind man's thinking, What's going on? What's going on? Yeshua's reaching down and he's, he's rubbing his finger in the spittle. He's, he's mixing up a little mixture of mud, you know, spittle and, and, and clay you know, because he's in Israel, and he pulls up this little mixture, this mud, you know, this spit, a spit mud clump mixture, and he begins applying it to the blind man's eyes. What's, what's with that? 
That doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm reminded in the Tanakh where, where the prophet says uh, to the man who has uh, uh, um, tzara'at, leprosy, he's, the, you know, the, 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 the leper says, heal me, heal me. And the prophet says, okay, go dip in the Jordan seven times. Come back and you'll be healed. And the leper thinks to himself, the Jordan? That's the best you can do? The Jordan's filthy. It's dirty. Look, I've got a mikvah in my backyard. Let's go there. It's clean. I know what's in the water. There are no leeches in the water. The water's clean. Can we just do it there? The prophet says, no, you've got to go to the Jordan. See, God doesn't make sense sometimes. And it's this, this mindset that causes natural man to think that God is a fool. In reality, God says to man, you're the fool. You're the fool. And it is the fool who is, is, is put off by God's words and God's ways. That doesn't stop God from doing the things that he does. And so here we are in the middle of a commandment, para aduma, where God says, take a cow, a red heifer, a female obviously, not a bull, but a cow. Take a, 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 a cow, a female cow, red one without blemish, completely burn it up, mix up a mixture of the ashes. Oh, and by the way, you're going to become unclean during the prep, but the mixture itself is going to be utils, uh, utilized or used to render you clean. So, what's in the, what ends up happening is that God is painting a picture for us. The state of Tuma, if you'll recall from Parashat, I'm, far, I'm sorry, from, uh, from our study of Tavaikar Levit Leviticus, Tuma itself, the noun, Tame is the adjective, Tuma itself is a, is, is, is a picture of death. When a person is unclean by God's Levitical standard, by God's sacrificial standard, by God's um, 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 what's the word I want to use? Uh, by temple standards, by tabernacle standards, um, by, by by those standards, when a person is unclean, they are really in a state of death. Unclean is is a state of dying. It's a, a state of decaying. And so, people in in the time of period of, of the Tanakh were going to re become unclean just with contact from everyday life, because life renders you tame. And what God was really saying and instructing to Israel is that I'm going to provide a way for you to change that status from unclean to clean. As you approach me, I'm going to give you commandments, statutes, ordinances, regulations, that if you walk into them, I will allow you to approach me and I will change the, the declaration from unclean to clean. You'll go from Tameh to Tahor. It's life from death. We go from the state of death into the state of life. And what ends up happening is with this particular mitzvah, the para aduma, God starts by telling them to kill a living thing. It's the same as it is with all the animal sacrifices in which death is the first step, but the end result is is life. Now, uh, obviously, those of you who are Christians and who are following my podcast and are familiar with Christian, basic Christian theology, you're beginning to see the larger picture that I'm describing. Life from death. So that at the death of one living being, life is produced for all of those involved. I don't want to give it away just yet, but you guys know where I'm going. So life from death. How is this possible? Well, only the will of Hashem could produce such an effect. Only God can take from death and darkness and bring light out of it and life. Now, particularly, and I'll just say it right now, we see this demonstrated graphically in Yeshua. That's right. Those of you who are already picking it up, uh, give yourself a pat on the back. Yeshua is the ultimate paradox. From the death of one individual, life was granted to the entire world. The events surrounding his death defiled everyone involved. Sometimes we have these silly um, contests. Who killed Yeshua? Who killed Jesus? Depending on which group you're in, it can go back and forth. The Jews killed Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus. God killed Jesus. No, Jesus laid down his own life. Which answer is correct? They're all correct. The events surrounding his death defiled everyone. Everyone who participated in his death was defiled. Well, guess what, people? That's everyone in the world. Because what drove Yeshua to the cross? You know the answer. It was the sin of every man. Every man 
we all sin. We have all sinned. Even the baby born from the womb, fresh from the womb, is going to sin sooner or later. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is a truth that we cannot escape. And so it is our sin that placed him on the cross. And because of our sin, we are defiled. And if you think about it, because our sin placed him on the cross, we are guilty of his death. We all are guilty. We have no excuse. Remember that the handling of the sacrificial victim defiles the handler. Yeshua was the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. And so because it wasn't just the Romans, it wasn't just the Jewish leaders of the uh, first century that handled him, as it were, in a very real way, I, R-E-L, handled Yeshua, the sacrifice. I placed him on the altar, and I drove the stakes through his hands and through his feet. I placed the crown of thorns on his head. I stuck the spear in his side. And guess what? I slew the Son of God. That's right. If you're listening to my podcast today, it doesn't matter what station of life you come from, male, female, Jew, Gentile, whatever. You did the very same thing. You're guilty too. We're all guilty. We are guilty of slaying the Son of God. And guess what? We've been defiled. Thus, everyone from the prosecutors to those who mocked him to the executioner who drove the nails, everyone was made unclean. We are all tame. We are all tame. We placed him there as much as any Roman or Jew involved directly in that century. We cannot point the finger at anyone else. We did it. Our transgression caused him to become the sacrifice for sin. Therefore, we are also defiled. Not only does our own sin defile us, but guess what? It was our own sin that drove him there. Our rejection of God himself drove the Son of God to die on the execution stake. Our sin rejected God, and in the rejection, we drove him to his death. But the end result is what makes the significant difference. And that's where we make our connection with the Torah portion today. True, God says, slay the cow. Slaughter it. Burn it up completely. But that's not where it stops. In the case of the red heifer, the resulting ash played the central part in the cleansing of those who were Tamei. Do you see? God knew the end from the beginning. He knew why the instructions were being given. He knew why the Son of God was going to the execution stake. It's true that the adversary thought, Aha! I've won! I've defeated the Son of God! I've killed him! But if the adversary knew that that was just the beginning of the ultimate redemption offered by God, in the case of Yeshua, his shed blood plays a central part in our cleansing. That's right. If it were not for his death, we would be without hope in this world. He had to die. It was God's plan. Were it not for the blood which was freely spilled, we would forever be in a state of spiritual tame. We would all be unclean. Thanks be unto God that the blood was poured out. Thanks be unto God that the, that the cow was slaughtered. Do you see how this points towards Yeshua? The Torah was designed to teach us about the truths of who Yeshua is and what his ministry means to us. And the para aduma, which is a, 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 a mystery indeed, is a type and shadow of the Son of God. This brings out the importance of understanding the Torah and matters related to faith. Okay, If we... In the 21st century church, if we reduce the Torah to legalistic misunderstandings, then what we end up doing is we cut short the miraculous workings of our heavenly Abba, especially where matters of Tamei and Tahora, unclean and clean respectively, are concerned. We've got to study the Torah so that we can understand the concepts of clean and unclean. Even though we don't have a temple or a tabernacle today, that doesn't matter. Clean and unclean are concepts that God is trying to teach us so that we can understand our relationship to Him and to one another. 
It is true that those phrases, Taman Tahor, gained their greatest specificity during the time period of the Tanakh and the Temple, when there was a priestly cult, when there were animal sacrifices, and the like. Whenever we had the Holy Sancta there, then this was a very real physical more, more so more so than it is a spiritual. But now that the temple has been removed from our presence, which is a bad thing, by the way. It's not a good thing that the temple is gone. It's a bad thing. We still must understand that God has not changed. And that if we wish to approach God, we must consider ourselves, we must consider our bodies as living sacrifices. And, and in Paul's admonition in Romans chapter 12, which I'm referring to, he says, present these bodies... Holy and acceptable unto God. You see how that works? We still have the concepts of, of clean and unclean, even though we don't have a temple and a tabernacle. Uh, don't get me wrong. It, it, it doesn't have the same significance. However, the, the spiritual um, importance behind this term is, is as real today as it was back then. I, as a believer in Messiah, if you want to call me a Christian, that's fine. I, as a believer in Messiah, I cannot simply do with my body whatever I please. Because I belong to God. My body is a living sacrifice to Him. I need to treat it as His temple. Indeed, that's what the Torah tells me. That the Spirit has taken up residence within me. And as the temple of the living God, I cannot put anything I want into my body. I cannot allow my body to go wherever I want to. I cannot allow my eyes to gaze upon whatever I want to. I cannot allow my hands to touch whatever I want to. I cannot allow my feet to go wherever I wish. I'm not my own. I'm His sacrifice. A living sacrifice. I don't have to die. Yeshua did that for me. But you understand the principle here. Sanctification is a very real part of every believer's life. Now again, it's true that Yeshua brought about a transformation in the Levitical priesthood, and ritual uncleanness is no longer an everyday issue. The matter of spiritual cleansing is still a stark reality, however. We must avail ourselves of the spiritual cleansing made possible by Yeshua in order that we can be included in the community of the called out ones. That's right. Back then, if you were Tameh, if you were unclean, you could be excluded from, temp I'm sorry, from tabernacle uh, participation. And in some cases, you could be excluded from community participation. You remember, when um, the, the person is declared a leper, it's put outside the camp. God says, don't allow the camp to become defiled with those who are unclean. In today's terms, if I defile my members by allowing them to practice unrepentant sin, then God has a right to put me outside of the community. I don't lose my salvation. Don't get confused at what I'm saying. But I can be put out of the community because I cannot be effectively used by God because my members become stained with sin. What do I need to do? Well, in today's terms, <clears throat> I need to avail myself of the forgiveness offered by Yeshua's sacrifice. I need to cry out to God, Forgive me, wash me, cleanse me. You've already done it. I just need to, to, to appropriate the reality of it within myself. If I need to take a mikvah, take a mikvah. If I need to go to the altar and present my offering, my, I didn't do so. If I need to go to those whom I've wronged, I need to do that as well. Back then, the Tanakh was trying to demonstrate this very same procedure. Only the ashes of an unblemished female cow would suffice for this special ceremony where God said, if you are unclean, the ashes of the red heifer mixture will render you clean. Today, only the blood of a sinless human, the blood of Yeshua, could effectively cleanse fallen humanity from spiritual defilement. Okay? So, we've got to understand now, as we make the connection between the Torah portion and Yeshua, He is our para aduma. He is our red heifer. And with that, it's about 37 minutes into the commentary. I'm going to call this part A. And when we return, we'll be at the middle of page 3, and we're going to talk about the journeyings of Israel here in the book of Numbers. They did a lot of wandering. Remember, this is the book of, of wanderings, right? The 38 years that they wandered around the desert. And so, in the next section, part B, and I believe we'll just have two parts maybe to this Torah portion today, maybe three at the most. It's not a long commentary. It's only, uh, let's see... It's only seven pages, really. 
eight pages with my uh, little um, uh, tag on the end. And so uh, when we come back, we'll talk about their journeys from Kadesh to Moab. And we're going to discuss the uh, topics of disobedience, death, and desert dilemmas. Okay? Stay tuned. <laughs> 